Uh, our guest today is Professor Ian Gregory, um, uh, and he is he has a CV that that is difficult to summarize because it's got so much cool stuff in it. Uh, Professor Gregory is a pioneer in historical GIS, geographical information systems, and on that I refer to an absolutely unimpeachable source, namely Wikipedia, uh, which lists <laughs> Professor Gregory as as one of the key citations and. Again, the very informal theme of this year at IHS is historical GIS. So it was very satisfying to know that we had uh, Ann Knowles here earlier. Now we have Professor Gregory. We have covered a good part of what Wikipedia considers essential to historical GIS. So we're down. Um, uh, Professor uh, Gregory co-founded the uh, Lancaster. I'm, I'm from New York. It's Lancaster. I know it's Lancashire or something like that. But anyway, it's Lancaster uh, Digital Humanities Center. Uh, which, and I'll quote, draws together methodological expertise in fields such as spatial humanities, corpus linguistics, natural language processing, artificial intelligence, and applies them across humanities disciplines. And the range of projects supported by that center is really remarkable. It ranges from things like water scarcity in South Asia to uh, text mining colonial gazetteers to better understand uh, 17th century Mexico, and Professor Gregory's own work has this similar cross-disciplinary energy. Uh, he's exploring spatial aspects of late district literature, combining things like more conventional GIS, the uh, changes in vegetation patterns, but also some advances in text mining. And again, I'll quote, understanding imprecise space and time in narratives through qualitative representations, reasoning, and visualization. Uh, and this research was funded by a joint um, UK Economic and Social Research Council grant, and at one point a, a US NSF grant. Um, and that's like so amazingly cool because apparently like governments can collaborate on things other than military misadventures. I mean, who knew? But uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Professor Gregory. Thank you for joining us. Thanks very much for uh, for inviting me, and thanks for that uh, those kind words of introduction. Yeah, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is actually still currently work in progress that's being co-funded between, as you say, the UK Research uh, Economic and Social Research Council and the US National Science Foundation, and uh, it involves some partners at Stanford and Oregon and IUPUI and various other places like that. Um, so I will just. Got technology working. Um, there we are. Can you see that? Okay. Yes. Yeah, great. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, as you say, is um, a project which in one shape, well, a series of projects, I suppose, in one shape or another have been going on for about the best part of 10 years now, where we've been looking at um, how we can use digital technologies like geographical information systems to uh, explore textual sources. Um, GIS is much better known for its uses in uh, with quantitative material and things like the environmental sciences uh, and perhaps the social sciences with things like uh, census data and mortality data and that sort of thing. What we've been trying to do is to make it much more adaptable and usable for textual sources and quite a bit of that work by no means all of it but quite a bit of that work has been focused on um writing about the english lake district which is not very far from here um area with a rich literary history i'll say a little bit more about it um on which i'm not really an, a subject expert but i've had to learn quite a lot as we've been pioneering and uh, developing these uh, techniques and approaches so what I'm going to talk about um, kind of covers a bit of a, a range of work we've done over a number of years, but particularly um, our original approach to how we could, I'll say how we do this in a minute, but our original approach to uh, how you go about mapping what, what a text, where a text is talking about and what it is saying about those places. And then more recently, some of the criticisms we've come up with on that approach and then how we've gone about addressing some of those uh, 
those criticisms. So that's basically what I'll be talking about over the next half an hour, 40 minutes, uh, something like that. So what we're working with is a collection of texts about the written about the English Lake District from some very early texts uh, going back to about 1622. Up until about 1900, we stop around there because um, copyright and things like that, largely pragmatic things like copyright starting to get in the way and so on. Uh, but within that, we've got about 80 different texts. It stretches to about one and a half million words. So it's not a vast collection of texts. Some of the other work we've done um, uses collections up to about a billion words and more. Uh, but this is relatively small, but that brings with it some advantages, partly technical, but also interpretive, because if you start running with very, very large collections, you start to make it harder to understand, whereas with relatively small collections, you can still, there is enough there to, uh, to interpret some of the patterns that you begin to find. The so Lake District's um, relatively, relatively small area in the northwest of England. Um, it has England's both highest mountains, not very high, at about uh, nine, just a little over 900 metres, getting on uh, slightly over 3,000 feet, but not very much more than that. Uh, and also some of its deepest lakes as well. Uh, it, combined with its well-known natural beauty, it's got a very rich uh, literary history to it, particularly famous for William Wordsworth, but also a range of other well-known writers as well, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Thomas West, Thomas Gray, Celia Fiennes, all wrote about it as an area. Um, and we've been using this partly, this corpus, partly to uh, develop and prototype techniques that we can use to um, get a better understanding of how we can use textual sources in this kind of geospatial environment, but also to uh, hopefully the end game of it, which is to to get a better understanding uh, of the literary history of the Lake District uh, as well. So I said what we're trying to do is to, uh, the, the core of what we're trying to do is to understand the geographies within text. That's, that's really what it's about, understanding the geography within text and using digital technologies to do it. In some very early work, the way we went about doing this was we uh, thought that the easy way of getting to geography, getting at geography, was to identify the place names within the text. Um, and we took, uh, in the very early work, we simply did that by hand. So we went through a couple of the texts uh, using uh, XML markup to, uh, when you identify a place name, just put a tag around it, like these PL name tags you can see down here, that means place name. Prospect Bridge is one place name, Port and Scale is another uh, place name. Newlands down uh, near the bottom uh, is another place name mentioned twice. We're also, in this case, flagging whether they visited it. So you've got that visited equals Y uh, field if he actually went there uh, when he's talking about it. But the basics of it was simply go through by hand to identify the identify the place names within the text. Once you've done that, you can pull all the place names out uh, and match them uh, largely in an automated way, but also using manual approaches to cope with things like spelling variations. Uh, match the place names which we've got on the left on this to what's called a place name gazetteer, which basically gives you the the place uh, a long list of place names. Uh, combined with the latitude and longitude or uh, eastings and northings of them. Best name play, best known at place name gazetteer is Geonames, which is freely available. Um, we were actually using one produced by Britain's National Mapping Agency for this, but they all use basically the same structure, which is the one shown uh, on the right of this screenshot where you've got place names, and then you've uh, got uh, either, lat this one's got both latitude and longitudes uh, and northings and eastings for both of those place names. So when you join those together, you get something that looks a little bit like this, where you've got your original spellings of the place names, you've got standardised spellings as, appear, uh, as appears in the gazetteer, perhaps some other information that you've pulled out, uh, but crucially you've got either your eastings and northings or your latitude and longitude, uh, and you can use that uh, as the basis for uh, subsequent mapping. However, uh, the weakness with that obviously is identifying those place names by hand is a slow and time consuming task, even with a relatively small corpus like the Lake District corpus. 
So instead, uh, with later work, we moved to a process called geoparsing, uh, which attempts to do that in an automated way. So you can see here we've got uh, a screenshot of uh, William Wilberforce's journey from the Lake, uh, journey to the Lake District from Cambridge. Uh, this is the raw XML as we typed it up without place names identified. It looks kind of neat and relatively easy to understand from this. You run it through a geoparser and it attempts to both identify the place names uh, and to give them to uh, give them a latitude and longitude. So this is what it looks like once it's been geoparsed. It's horribly messy, I accept. Uh, but you can see we've got Hornby as a place name that was on that previous slide. And Hornby is now surrounded by uh, an e, what's called an enamx tag that identifies it as a place name. And within that uh, tag, it's also got latitude and longitude for it. And that's the critical thing, because uh, once you've got the latitude and the longitude, uh, again, we can map it pretty easily. Uh, not planning on saying much about the, the ins and outs of this at the moment. It's quite an error prone process if you do it in an automated way. And we had to do quite a lot both to improve the ways, uh, the accuracy of it, partly using semi automated techniques uh, and partly just going through and uh, correcting the biggest mistakes by hand. But at the end of it, We'd identified out of that one and a half million cor uh, word corpus, nearly 40,000 place names for which we could find locations, coordinate based locations, most of which were in the UK and most of which were in and around the Lake District. Uh, and the map there shows uh, what happens when you map them. You get a lot of dots across the map, which isn't terribly helpful, but you can then get into <laughs> geospatial geospatial techniques like uh, density smoothing, as it's called which just mm -hmm. tries to smooth out that pattern and highlight the areas with the most place name mentions and separate those from those with fewer place name mentions. And that's what you've got on this slide here with the, the most mentioned places being in the dark greens. So I don't know if any of you know this area, but if you do, perhaps this pattern doesn't come as a huge surprise, which is usually a good thing, because if it is a big surprise, it tends to suggest something's gone very wrong with your methods rather than uh, anything novel with your technique. But uh, what you've got here, this is Keswick, which is one of the main tourist centers. And then you've got Downer Valley south of that Derwent with Derwent Lake, a lake in it, Derwent Water, and Borrowdale beyond that. So you've got a big cluster around there. Skiddaw's one of the high mountains, that's a cluster. Uh, this is Scarfell, another cluster, another mountain, another cluster here. The Central Lake District, Langdale, Ambleside, Grasmere, that's a cluster, Windermere's a cluster, et cetera, et cetera. So we're able to, identify which parts of the Lake District are frequently being talked about, and separate them out from other parts of the Lake District, which are far less commonly talked about. And in some ways, um, one of the surprising things is just how, how clustered this pattern actually is, just how, which in other words means people tend to talk a lot about some places, but a lot of it for a very, uh, very written about and rich landscape is actually ignored or very sparsely talked about. And that in itself, I think, is quite interesting, maybe something we could follow up on. So where that gets you to is um, the ability to ask, where is a corpus talking about? Uh, what place names are within the corpus? Where are they? How can we summarize that pattern? Which is a good start, but really what you're interested in is questions more about where is being talked about in relation to pick particular themes or perhaps what is being said about particular places and this is where um, natural language processing corpus linguistics these sorts of text mining approaches uh, become useful because within that there's a concept known as well, well we've modified slightly uh, to, to develop something called a place name co-occurrence which basically says you pick to start with, you pick a search term that you're interested in. So we're going into this uh, from the perspective of we have a theme that we're interested in, in this case, the sublime, and we'll want to know what places are being associated within the corpus by the sub, uh, uh, as sublime. And the way we do this, a simple computational approach, is the idea of co occurrences, uh, in which basically if the toponyms are within 10 words with using a span of 10 words. I could say a little bit more about why we pick that, if you like. But within a span of 10 words of, um, if a place name is within a span of 10 words of uh, our search term, uh, 
then we're assuming that the two are being talked about in relation to each other. And if it's more than 10 words, then we're assuming that it isn't. So in this first text fragment here, we've got on the pinnacle of the mighty Helvellyn, how sublime an elevation, how glorious a panorama, because Helvellyn, so one of the high mountains in the Lake District, uh, is within 10 words of sublime, we're assuming that Helvellyn is actually being described as sublime. Similarly, on the, the fragment below, the scenery about Buttermere is truly sublime and august on a promontory, blah, blah, blah. Buttermere is within uh, 10 words of sublime, so we're assuming Buttermere is being described as sublime. That bottom fragment shows that it doesn't always work perfectly, uh, still presenting the same appearance of sublime confusion of the mountains of Black Coombe, Scarfell, Coniston, Old Man, Helvellyn, Fairfield, Hill Bell, etc., etc. Uh, where you've got that long, you've got quite a long list of uh, mountains uh, in there, and only the first two are being picked up within our uh, 10 word search term, the rest are being missed out. Uh, and occasionally you get false positives as well. But nevertheless, we've found this 10 word span works fairly well in reflecting a pattern of what places are being associated with a particular theme. And then when we come to map that using the same kind of idea, uh, we can see that on the left hand side, these are the areas, the, the, dark, the dark shaded areas are the ones that are being most frequently described as sublime. So again, we've got Keswick up here, we've got the, the Western Fells, the high mountains to the West over here. This is Coniston, this is Windermere, Oldswater and so on. Um, I'm not gonna say much more about this, but uh, this map on the right is just trying to uh, compensate for the fact that, as I uh, said earlier, some places are much more talked about than others. Uh, and this tries to compensate for that by identifying places that are being described as sublime more than you would expect, given the background geography. You can see there's a particular, uh, what it's really saying is that it's these western fells over here, uh, places like Scarfell and Wasdale uh, that are particularly being associated with sublime more than you would expect. They're not talked about all that much in the corpus, but when they are, they're frequently described as sublime is really what that's saying. Um, another example of that from some slightly more recent work, we were interested in following up on Wordsworth's kind of three-way description of people in the Lake District as being either tourist travellers or inhabitants. Uh, the distinction between inhabitants and the other two is fairly obvious, inhabitants are the people that live there, uh, but he draws this distinction, which I think we still use today in many cases, between tourists and travellers, where tourists tend to be, well, tourist Wordsworth was fairly blunt about describing as fairly superficial people who go from one place to another, uh, visit the well-known, seen as visiting the well-known beauty spots and not really appreciating what they're looking at, whereas travellers are a much more discerning group who, um, oops, sorry, much more discerning group who uh, are trying to understand the landscape that they're looking at in much more depth. Um, so we were using this same approach, this uh, place name co-occurrence approach, to identify the places being associated with those three groups. Um, tourists, again, not a major surprise here. It's the, the kind of major uh, towns and settlements, uh, in particular Keswick up here, uh, Ambleside and Grasmere down here, Windermere and Bowness down here, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, over here, we've got the traveler's pattern, which isn't so different, but is definitely a bit more dispersed than the tourist pattern. And inhabitants, uh, very spread out, so you're not getting this clear clustering pattern that you're getting on the other two. But actually, what's interesting with this, and what I want to pick up on for much of the rest of this talk, is that with tourists in the corpus as a whole, we've got 400 mentions of the word tourist or tourists, which uh, co-occur with uh, a place named 332 times. Traveller as a word is used more, there's almost 600 instances of that, but it only co-occurs with place names 237 times. An inhabitant, similar number of occurrences as to tourists, just over 400, mm -hmm. uh, but only co-occurs with a place named 92 times. So where that gets you, potentially, but wrongly, is the idea that, um, well, what that appears to show is that tourism is or being a tourist is a much more geographical uh, thing, phenomenon, approach than being a traveller or being an inhabitant, because tourists tends to collocate or co-occur with place names much more frequently than traveller or inhabitant. 
but that's kind of problematic. Uh, it's difficult because um, place names are one way of thinking about geography, uh, but only one way. There are other ways of thinking about geography, and this approach is completely blind to uh, these other approaches. And that's really what started us thinking on the way this new project is working, which is where we become more interested in um, are there other ways of representing geography than place names that are then uh, taken down to point maps and then smoothed out and so on and so forth. So where we uh, before I get into that, though, there are some other criticisms uh, of that, the kind of approach I've been talking about so far that we can make as well. Uh, it's a very GIS GIS based view of place. Not perhaps not very surprising. When we started this work, we were really interested in asking the question: Well, can we actually deal with textual sources within a GIS? To which the answer uh, was yes, we could. But for having done that, you're then interested in perhaps some broader question, which is. Um, how can we summarize the geographies within text in a digital environment so going beyond gis to try and get at the kind of ways of representing geography that gis isn't very good at uh at representing so gis does you a very good job if you've got coordinate based locations uh, and want to map it it doesn't do a good job uh, or it can't really cope with things that don't have coordinates associated with them so that brings us on to the second criticism, which from this representation, place can only be toponym based. Uh, and if it doesn't geopars, if you can't find coordinates for it, as far as the GIS is concerned, it isn't a place. Uh, and indeed, there are some more problems with that, which I could come back to with GIS. I could come back to certainly in this approach, which is if, if you can't map a place particularly well with a point, so things like rivers and lakes and so on aren't that well represented in the kinds of analysis I've been talking about uh, up until this point. Uh, another problem is that um, bec because we're using this style of mapping, the style of mapping shown on the, the right hand corner of this slide uh, is very good at um, representing Euclidean geography that we're all quite familiar with looking at. But that's not necessarily the way writers are per perceiving places. This is a, a landscape of lakes and mountains. You can travel in some directions very easily, but it's very difficult to travel in other directions. So writers may not be perceiving the landscape in the way that uh, a Euclidean based map, uh, straight line distances in all directions uh, tend to represent. So uh, that's potentially problematic as well. And perhaps related to that, uh, on a map like the one I've got on the screen at the moment, the narrative structure is completely removed. And we've started with the text, but we've almost completely thrown that away. And we're simply mapping place names that co-occur with, um, with the search term that we're interested in uh, without any idea of how that those patterns are being formed. So uh, to take two ext at one extreme, that pattern there simply could have been uh, caused by one writer having a particularly intense uh, rant or whatever uh, about tourists, uh, or those could be spread evenly across the entire corpus. There's no, there's no, a lot of these description, uh, a lot of these texts are descriptions that either of journeys or they're guidebooks. But the idea of how different places are connected, are being connected by the writers, uh, has completely gone uh, in this representation. So, having some some of the narratives, getting some of the narrative structure back in. Uh, was something that we saw uh, as being desirable. So addressing some of these criticisms is uh, what I want to come on to talk about, how we can uh, perhaps start to think about place in a slightly less GIS-centric, if that is a word, uh, GIS-centric uh, way. I want to begin with uh stepping away completely away from gis to talk about a little bit about the theory of place and the theory of geography as described by uh, agnew and cresswell in particular who come up with this kind of tripartite definition of place or description of place where they say that place typically consists of uh actually three components or dimensions uh and when people are describing place 
you arguably need all of them, or at least there's certainly different ways into describing place. So on the one hand, you've got location, which is where an object or an activity actually occurs. Um, secondly, we've got something that they describe as locale. Never really like that word because it's a bit vague, but uh, locale is the, the material things that constitute the place. So it might be mountains, it might be towns, it might be buildings, it might be rivers. It's these kinds of things. Uh, and then we've got sense of place, which is slightly different in that it's uh, a little bit harder to pin down. It's the intangible elements that uh, that make the place unique, that uh, write, in this case, that writers are describing as being associated with that place that give it its sense of place, that uh, are what makes it perhaps the place that it is, the, the reason you might want to visit it or might want to not visit it. So what we were trying to do is think through how we could get all of these into a digital environment. Location, we've largely, I've talked about already, we've largely done it. Uh, you start with top and energy, you identify those top and to get a coordinate. That gives you uh, at least a starting measure on location. Locale's also not very difficult, uh, perhaps even slightly easier than uh, location because you don't need coordinate but what you need to do we we decided was simply identify the geographical features that are being described which are all uh, nouns what we're calling geographical feature nouns or G gfns and i'll say a little bit about how we can define those at the, in a minute but what you're looking for are what are the the kind of nouns that are making up the description of place in there so it's things like mountain uh, mountain, river, lake, and so on and so forth. But obviously, you want a much longer list. And I'll come up to uh, describe how we can uh, come up with that list uh, in a minute. And then, sense of place. Well, in the example, particularly the first example I gave, we were simply deciding in advance that the sense of place we were interested in was sublime. And we've picked other search terms as well uh, in different bits of work. But we're simply picking up on one word or maybe multi-word search terms and then looking for where they are. Whereas we wanted a, um, a more flexible approach to this that would, rather than giving a predefined list that would actually identify um, the words that the writers were using to describe sense of place. Uh, and as I'll come on to, uh, the obvious candidates are things like adjectives, adverbs, nouns, and verbs. Uh, actually, adverbs don't work particularly well, but adjectives, nouns, and verbs all give you slightly different things. Adjectives obviously are very descriptive. Verbs tend to give you uh, more information about events, what's happening at a place. Uh, nouns give you bits of both. Uh, so it's trying to pin down these sorts of words that are being associated with the place. So to talk through a little bit more about some of that, uh, defining geographical feature now. So these are, these get us into locales. Uh, we're looking for nouns that refer to geographical features from the physical, human and administrative geographies. Uh, exactly where you start and finish with that is inevitably slightly subjective. We did decide to include things like transport related words. So train, road, path, ferry, things like that are included. But the more abstract terms like uh, route or uh, journey, the journey, uh, the view, the scenery, things like that, uh, we decided wouldn't be. Uh, and obviously words that are parts of proper nouns like Lake Windermere or Derwent Water, in this case, lakes and lake and water, we didn't, ex we excluded as well. But basically we came up with a, a list of seed, seed nouns that we started with that we thought would be relevant. Uh, lake, mountain, river, hill, tarn, which is a small lake, uh, very common uh, description of a small lake in this part of the world, uh, town and so on. And we were looking for other words that occur near to those uh, we found those using a technical collocation. I'm not going to go into, into that here. Um, added additional words as a result that we felt were geonouns, then repeated the process until we, we uh, felt we had a good long list of them, probably identified most, if not all, of the relevant ones. And in the end, we came up with 153 of those. Uh, the most common being lake occurs over 5,000 times in the corpus, mountain four and a half thousand times, road 3,000, water, hill, rock, house, and so on and so forth. Um, so although these words aren't 
although there aren't a huge number of these words, there's about 153 of them compared with many thousands of different place names, they're actually a bit more common than place names. There's 75,000 uh, instances of them occurring within the corpus. There's only about 40,000 of place names. So they are very, the, the corpus, perhaps not surprisingly, given what it's talking about, uh, is very, very rich in this, these geographical feature nouns. So let's go back to tourist travelers and inhabitants. Uh, we did this in an ever so slightly different way, but only slightly different, because uh, in the first bit of the analysis I was talking about, we were talking about a co-occurrence occurring when our place name and search term were within 10 words of each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, in this work, we've used whether they're within the same sentence. I can say a little bit more about that as you like, if you like, but uh, it doesn't make a huge difference to the result. So we can see with um, place name toponym co-occurrences, uh, we're finding a pattern of, as I said, tourists being much more associated with toponyms and travellers who are much more associated with them than inhabitants. Um, what we find, though, when we look at the same thing for geographical feature nouns, the ones I was just talking about, is we find in some ways almost the opposite, that actually travellers are much more associated with these geographical feature mm -hmm. nouns than inhabitants are associated with them, and then tourists actually less least of all. So the kind of false conclusion that I set up earlier, um, that tourism was seen as much more geographical than um, tra being a traveller or being an inhabitant, uh, is revealed exactly to be false from this. In fact, travellers are actually, uh, in this kind of crude quantitative way of measuring it, travellers are actually more geographical or more associated with geography than tourism, uh, tourists uh, and inhabitants coming in uh, again last on that. But the, I think the really interesting thing is that travellers tend to be associated with geographical features, whereas tourists tend to be associated with actually precisely defined place name based locations and that's causing uh, a very different way of thinking about geography as a result and similarly inhabitants although less associated with geography tend to be much more associated again with feature rather than with particular location um going through what you say too much about these but going through the lists of which ones they're most associated with you actually find that tourists and travelers when it comes to place names uh, let's just stick with place names for now, toponyms for now. Uh, tourists and travellers tend to be associated with uh, a fairly predictable list of particularly uh, the more urban centres, Keswick, Campbellside, Penrith, Windermere and so on. Uh, inhabitant is actually quite a different pattern. Cumberland is one of the three historic counties that used to make up the Lake District, which they're associated with. Kendall's one of the market towns, which perhaps surprisingly doesn't feature on the top 10 of uh, tourists or travellers. Uh, Ulfa is quite a small place, I'll come back to it. Westmoreland's another county, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, not only are the places that are being, not only uh, are inhabitants less associated with place names than uh, the other two groups, the places that they are associated with are quite different than the other two groups as well. And you find actually something quite similar for the geographical feature nouns. Most common ones, Lake Mountain Road, but particularly associated with tourists and traveller. Interestingly, road in particular being strongly associated with those two. Whereas for inhabitants, town stands out, so does village, so does house, uh, uh, country as well. But it tends to be much more uh, the human places, the towns and the human geography of it that's associated with inhabitants, whereas uh, it's the physical features and the roads that are associated with tourists and uh, tourists and travellers. Sense of place. How do we get sense of place into all this? Because sense of place doesn't, as the name implies, doesn't. You can talk about uh, toponyms and about uh, geographical feature nouns, geo nouns, uh, locations and locales in their own right, but sense of place has to be attached to one of those. So what we were trying to do here was identify the adjectives the nouns and the verbs that are associated with both the toponyms and the geographical feature nouns, uh, really by looking for ones that co-occurred that were found in the same sentence uh, as them more frequently than you would expect if they were there by ra random. So using a statistical significance test. Uh, and in that way, 
you're trying to define the sense of place for uh, both the, the geographical feature nouns uh, and the toponyms for all three different groups. So we're getting well into a lot of co-occurrence here. So if a sentence has the word tourist and the word lake in it, then we're looking for the, the adjectives, nouns and verbs that are also in that sentence that are occurring more commonly than we might expect at random. Um, and those would then be what, what, what the sense of place for lakes and uh, for tourists. Uh, is and how tourists are perceiving lakes, or as lake, how lakes are being associated with tourism, as perhaps how lakes are being associated with travellers, or indeed how mountains are being associated with tourists, and so on and so forth. Uh, to try to make that sound a little bit more coherent, this is what this is the way we started to then represent that. So, to talk through this uh, network diagram a little bit more slowly, what we've got here are the nodes, uh, the circles. Uh, the shaded circles are the the toponyms that are being associated with tourists. Uh, I'll come on to the shading in a minute, but the size corresponds with how frequently each of those places is being associated with with tourists. Then the edges, the lines that are joining these together. So I said we wanted to try and keep some idea of textual structure in there. So if, for instance, Keswick and Penrith occur in the same sentence as the word tourist uh, and as a, and with each other, then we call that an edge between the two. So we're seeing see from that that uh, Keswick is commonly uh, Keswick and tourist is uh, Keswick and Penrith are commonly associated with tourists. Keswick and Ambleside further down are commonly associated with tourists, and so on and so forth. So that's where you're getting the the thick edges on that. Mm. And then we're shading these. Uh, we're using a technique called modularity clustering to associate these together. So basically a cluster is places that are frequently associated with each other textually, rather than in the previous maps where we were showing places that were frequently associated with each other spatially, so that we're close together on the map. These are places that are close, effectively places that are close together in the text, rather than places that are close together on the map. Although, as you can see, and perhaps not surprisingly, the two tend to associate quite closely. So places that are talked about uh, close together in the text also tend to be relatively close together on the map. Um, that doesn't always hold. It does particularly for tourists, and I think that reflects the fact that these tourist guides tend to talk you around itineraries from one place to the next. Therefore, you tend to be talking about uh, place names, uh, associating place names that are quite close to each other. And then associating these with sense of place is what we get on the right here. What this table is doing, the shading is the same as the clusters on the left. So we can see that the most, the biggest cluster is has got Ke Keswick and Penrith and Skiddo as its most common nodes. They've talked about places. And then we're associating that with both geonouns and with sense of place words, the statistically significant sense of place words. So where does that get you? Rather a lot in all that. Where does that get you? Um, so you can see that we've got this cluster in the North Lakes, uh, although it's uh, coming out textually rather than geographically, which is Keswick, Penrith, Skiddaw, it's a mountain up here, uh, and so on in it, uh, which are associated with tourists. Uh, and the sense of place that's being built up for it is quite interesting because the most common words are words like mile, right, North, LNW, you'll come back to that, proceed, turn and inquire. All of those are very functional words. Miles obviously associated with direction. Right is again direction. North is direction. LNW, there used to be a railway station in Keswick for the London and North Western Railway, commonly known as LNWR. Uh, and LNW are sticking out because of that. Uh, and then we've got words, uh, verbs like proceed and turn and inquire, which are again very much about directions and uh, what you might do in a place you're inquiring about accommodation or whatever. So it's a very functional list of words. And you get uh, another cluster that's quite similar with this is that purple one, Windermere down here, Windermere and Bowness. Uh, Bowness in particular is quite another tourist centre. And we're having the same sort of very functional uh, list of words associated with sense of place, things like uh, East Guide abode accommodation and so on. Other clusters a little bit more sense of place is a little bit more interesting. Buttermere, this area off to the right, this was quite a common ex day excursion, but quite a hard day excursion from Keswick, where a lot of tourists stayed. 
and you're seeing that we're getting uh, words like difficult, unfamiliar, tempting, day excursion, and so on. So we're actually getting words that tend that are more about describing what the excursion over there is going to be like. But it's still, in some ways, quite, um, quite pr process-based, quite uh, functional, rather than uh, some of the more uh, landscape description words that we might expect uh, elsewhere. So that's tourist toponyms. We did the same for tourist geographical feature nouns, uh, same kind of idea. So for tourists, the, the major cluster is associated with lakes in particular, and perhaps things you do on lakes like boats and shores and so on. Uh, district, not using lake district as one, but district of the lakes or lakes in the district is causing that. And again, it's very functional, typically very functional words associated with it. East adjacent head guide and so on and so forth. We have got some more descriptive words like beautiful and beauty in there. And that's fairly typical for a lot of things. Road is the second most common cluster. Uh, we've got things like Vale River, Bank and Stream on there. That tends to be because the road runs through a vale or crosses a river, crosses a stream. It's very functional stuff. And again, we get uh, quite uh, functional words associated with it. And that's pretty typical for a lot of the tourist clusters that we find uh, using this approach. Travellers, we find something quite different, although in some ways, um, particularly with toponyms, there are also quite a lot of similarities. But you can see we've got uh, sim in some ways quite similar clusters here. We've got this red cluster, it's the most popular one. It's centered on Keswick. Uh, it stretches over to Penrith, but it also takes in one of the other uh, popular lakes, Oldswater, uh, a place which is interestingly associated with travelers, but not so much with tourists. Uh, and you can see, though, that uh, within this cluster, you get much more landscape appreciation type words, beautiful, sublime, excellent, uh, and so on and so forth. But again, there's quite a lot of directions in there, too. Tour, leave, come, follow, M, which is mile, and so on and so forth. Skirt in the sense of skirting around a mountain, that kind of thing. Um, you can also see that in the other clusters, too, that we get uh, the Patterdale one, this area here, Patterdale, Grasmere and Central Lake, high, bleak, charming, pastoral, sterile, sweet and so on. Uh, Coniston over here, beautiful, uh, long, circular, leisurely. It's describing journeys uh, and it's getting these sorts of words in it. So it's a bit more, it's developing a bit more of a, an appreciated sense of place for traveller toponyms, but uh, it's still in some ways quite descriptive. Well, when we come on to traveller uh, geonouns or geographical feature nouns, this is where we really find the richness of sense of place. So um, the most popular um, the most popular cluster within this is, again, roads and things associated with roads like passes, inns, houses and so on. But even on that, you're getting quite strong uh, sort of uh, landscape appreciation where it's excellent tolerable, unpleasant. I think some of these are referring to things like the, the accommodation and so on. When you move to lake, though, and all the things associated with that, you're getting fine, beautiful, sublime views, scene and so on. Mountain. Mountain's quite an interesting one because you're getting words like difficult, steep, tremendous, top, pleasure and so on. So climbing a mountain. Mountains in, in this case are things to be climbed. The climb can be hard, but it's worth doing. The tourist mountains tend to be things to be looked at from the bottom, uh, perhaps gone <laughs> around appreciated this kind of thing but uh, tend to be quite uh, quite basic from that point of view traveler inhabitants you get something very different inhabitants with toponyms tend to be rarely associated with each other so you don't really get much of a uh, of a graph at all uh, when inhabitants are associated with places they tend to be individual places and again you're not getting that much of a sense of place an inhabitant uh, inhabitants again geonomes are being associated with them uh, and they, they you do start to pick up so for instance towns small neat ancient and so on um houses going up, explain some of these in a lot more detail but for reasons of time i i won't but again you're able to pick up a very different sense of place for the kinds of places associated with inhabitants both through our location based toponym based approach and our uh geonome based approach as well but I'll just sum that up at this point to, first of all, say a little bit about uh, kind of a conclusion for um, 
the kind of tourist travelers inhabitants work and then a kind of more general conclusion so what we can see for tourists using this is very much the way tourists are associated with geography is about locations about places named places rather than about physical features geonames um they tend to have textual clusters of toponyms that are spatially associated with each other as well and sense of place tends to be very functional but you get a better sense of place developed uh with perhaps surprising with geographical features than you do with toponyms which tend to be the much more functional ones travelers by contrast the geography associated with travelers tends to be much more locale based in other words based around geographical features rather than specific locations which actually ties very nicely back to Wordsworth's idea of uh, travelers being people who would discern a landscape in their own right should be talked through the landscape uh, and what they're looking for rather than picking up on particular places that they should go or what they should see there um sense of place is particularly rich for locales and particularly for some types of locales perhaps not surprisingly lakes and mountains in particular uh really do attract uh, a very vivid sense of descriptions about them um inhabitants by by contrast are really not frequently associated with specific locations and the ones that they are tend to be quite marginal and quite peripheral to the lake districts it's quite interesting that the people that actually live there tend to almost be pushed out to the fringes and largely ignored in the middle uh, but where they are associated with it tends to be the human uh, centers the towns the houses the villages and so on uh, sense of place I could say a little bit more about how we get a sense of place for particular types of place but actually what tends to happen is particular themes get picked up on by well-known writers like Wordsworth and they get repeated over and over without much development of them and that associates places like Ulfa uh, and so on with particular themes within that to do with inhabitants but it's far less rich uh, for inhabitants than it is for tourists and travellers. More generally though what we're trying to get to is that uh, if we're trying to understand the geographies within text we need to go beyond simply uh, toponyms uh, and spatial clustering to think about other ways that geography is, is represented. Because uh, these are often quite different uh, and give quite different impressions, as we've seen with uh, tourists and travellers, uh, particularly. Um, they give quite a different impression than if you just focus on um, on maps of points. Um, one thing I haven't said much about, but which I hope rep, uh, remains through uh, a lot of our the the more detailed work we've talked about, is that what we've been doing here is producing what's sometimes referred to as distance summaries or uh, macro anal macro analytic summaries uh, of the of the text that we're working with. But if you want to understand why those patterns are being produced, you need to go back into the text themselves and read the the parts of them that are being commonly associated with the things that we're interested in to try and get that explanatory <clears throat> explanatory side to it that goes over and above the um the more descriptive thing that the maps i've been showing to date actually uh focus on um at the moment we're trying to divide things bring more textual structure in by dividing uh places up to be kind of more aggregate regions as made up of parts of journeys. This map on the right shows just one example of doing that. Uh, and we're also trying to apply these approaches as a contrast to a large collection of Holocaust survival test, uh, survivor testimonies, which are obviously very different, uh, partly from their theme, forced migration under horrendous circumstances rather than leisure journeys, but also because the way that places interacted with becomes very different. The Lake District texts tend to describe place, uh, place for its own sake, uh, whereas the uh, Holocaust text, place tends to be a backcloth from which events take place. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. why place is important to those testimonies. But they're being described many decades later, frequently by people who are very traumatized uh, at the time, and therefore are referring to place in a very different way to, <clears throat> to the Lake District text. 
and I'm hoping we'll have more to say on that in the not too distant future. But for now, uh, I will leave you on that. I very much welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have a question in chat or uh, I check? Uh, let's go start with one here. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, my my name is Kei Guo. Uh, so I have a quick question regarding the uh, geo parsing process. Uh, I wonder how well uh, is the. Uh... Well, say just a, a a brief word about your work to to no. know why you're interested in geo parsing. Oh, uh, well, I'm interested in digital humanity generally. Uh, I think oh, I have a. Uh, I'm working on a project uh, about mapping place names in, in people's daily uh, Chinese newspaper. Uh, so I'm generally interest, very interesting in, in terms of uh, how our place names uh, uh, two parts. So in China, I'm going to interrupt. Uh, uh, I was looking at what, what, where is China based on references in people's daily. So basically, <laughs> how, does, how does China go from the places that the Chinese Communist Party happens to hold after the Civil War to China? Because um, even when you're I'm summarizing your work because it's really cool. You needed to sell it. But anyway, because um, even when even even when you're saying that, you know, of course we all control all of what was formerly held by the Qing Dynasty. If in your flagship paper you're only mentioning key places, there's a disconnect between those two spatial senses. That's okay, right. Yeah, um, that? Thank you. So my, my question is how how accurate uh, is the geo passing to whatever uh, that is. Uh, it's performing uh, not only in terms of uh, the the ones that accurately picked up, but also the false negatives. Uh, those who might not be uh, picking up. Uh, yeah, is there any? Uh, yeah, yeah, just yeah. So I think that's a really good question, and it's one we've spent one we've spent a lot of time on uh, and explored in different contexts quite a lot. Actually, <laughs> when we started this work. Um, I thought that we would work on the Lake District stuff because it's quite a small corpus, uh, almost as a, some pilot work, uh, and then roll that out to um, some of the large newspaper collections we've got, which have you know up to about a billion words in them, uh, which were obviously the size I thought would make them more difficult. But actually, the newspaper material geopars better than the Lake District stuff because um newspapers tend to actually focus on a relatively small number of sub uh small number of place names that they would expect their readers to be able to locate themselves so it tends to be the more popular places whereas in travel writing uh people often pick up on very small obscure places partly to talk the reader through it but also partly to uh, it's almost a way of stamping that you understand this landscape or you know this landscape. So you name lots of places within it, almost as a way of showing off your knowledge. So actually, Geopars in the Lake District Corpus was much harder than we ever anticipated. And we had to, we developed something that we call concordance geoparsing as part of that, whereby uh, we would just pick a search term and geopars just the immediate text around that, which was quite easy to check. We checked that quite carefully. Uh, and create what we called an updates file, uh, which were the corrections that we made, which would then geopars another uh, another uh, relatively small subset, check it again, create more updates, and round and round it went, so that we would we think figure by the end of it have quite an accurate uh, bit of geoparsing for that corpus. But there are still errors in there. Um, so I suppose to come back to your question, it depends on two things. It depends on how rich the place naming is within your collection of newspapers or whatever it is, uh, is, and it also depends quite critically on how good or otherwise the gazetteer that you're using or gazetteers that you're using to to then uh, map, find locations for those coordinates are. Um, yeah, I think that's about uh, about where we get to with that. It's a rich area though. Hi, uh, Jacob Romano, postdoc in English. I, I wonder, the span of the corpus is, is quite long, and I wonder if you could say a little bit about how much sort of consistency or shift in these associations you find sort of diachronically across with each other, or if you've looked at that. Yeah, so we've done a certain amount of work on um, simply things like the extent to which the places named change over time uh, and also by genre 
uh, and also perhaps um, the 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 themes that emerge and how they change over time. So words like sublime, actually, no, picturesque is a particularly good one uh, because early on it had quite a specific meaning that was particularly associated with some quite poetic writers. And as time went on, it kind of almost lost its meaning uh, and almost became a a, a word that was used. Uh, was often quite frequently ridiculed as a bit pretent of a pretentious way of uh, describing landscape. Um, so we've done some work uh, largely, not so much in, on the individual dates of the text, but by uh, grouping the text into, for example, the early texts, which are usually pre, uh, pre sort of pre-romantic, where the, the uh, that where the um, picturesque writers and so on, people like Thomas Gray uh, are doing some of the early journeys into the Lake District. Then you can carve out the the romantic writers like Wordsworth and Coleridge and people like that from the particularly the early 19th century. And then the railways arrived in the Lake District in the 1840s, 1850s, and the Victorian tourist guides really start up from there. So you can separate those out again, and you do get some quite interesting uh, spatial patterns from that. What we haven't done is anything uh, looking a bit more at the, the geography, both in terms of locale and sense of place, the features and the sense of place that people are describing and how that changes uh, over time. It'd be quite interesting to do some more work on that. Please, yes. Hi, I'm Wendy. I'm a master's student in Rua, US. And so maybe I'm a bit off. I want to ask that I really like how you are saying that you are trying to use tourist travel and inhabitants to see that how they describe words. And I wonder, first of all, where is the data source you are looking at and how do you distinguish these sources from the tourist traveler or inhabitant? Thank you. So we weren't. When I say when we were doing tourist trap, what we were mapping with those three were the writer's impressions of where those uh, the writer's impression of where those people were and what was, what else was being associated with them. So the way that worked was rather than picking texts written by tourists or written for tourists, as opposed to texts written for travellers, uh, we were looking for place names, geographical feature nouns, and sense of place words that were found in the same sentence as uh, we're using that as a span, the same sentence as one of those three words, one or more of those three words. So in theory, actually, somebody who is the same person who, it, when they're out on a mountain or whatever, may be being described as a traveller, but when they get into town and are looking for accommodation, may be being described as a tourist, and therefore you're getting a different geography emerging that way. Um, if you see what I mean, does that answer your question? It's about the the way that these people, uh, these groups of people, are being described by the writers themselves, rather than trying to group the group the text by genres of these sorts of people. When I when we are looking at the piece of writing, we will see that whether we are describing them as a tourist or as a traveler, like it is based on how the writer describes these people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm there. We go on the video. Uh, I'm oh. Alyssa. I'm the IHS GRA here. I'm also in history. And my question is kind of similar to you said, was it Jacob? Jacob's, but focused more on the actual geography. Um, is there a difference in uh, what the writings or what the, the associations you're finding? like when the Lake District was, I mean, uh, not pre-industrial revolution, because I'm assuming that didn't really impact it, but I mean, I'm, I'm assuming the area changed over time, um, built up, became much more, much maybe more touristy uh, and aimed at tourists. Um, but is there any association or any changes in how things are described you know, in, in the older pre, I, I guess I'm not saying it very well, but before it got built up and then you said the railroads arrived, so I'm assuming more people, more yeah. industry, more things. And then are there any uh, descriptive changes as like maybe the areas built up or the geography and um, like areas itself are changing? Yeah, we could, we could and have 
cut it that way uh, on occasion, but the the kind of it, the the move from the kind of uh, romantic writers, uh, like Wordsworth, who was writing just in the immediate, largely in the pre-railway era, and was strongly opposed to the railway actually arriving uh, in the Lake District. Um, we can cut the difference between those earlier texts and the later ones, and have done in some of the other work that we're looking we've looked at, but that's mainly been focused on um, on um, place name based geographies rather than feature name geography. We also brought in um, more recently some stuff from social media, particularly Flickr, of where people are photographing the Lake District. Yeah. Uh, so that you can uh, compare that with the more historic writing to get a, another impression of it. What was quite interesting about doing that is that it has been this idea that over time um, people have moved away from picturesque type write, picturesque type tourism, which focuses on certain honey honeypot type places, viewing stations as they were then called, but uh, probably be called honeypots now. Um, to a more spread out kind of tourism. Actually, it's not the case. Uh, it seems to me actually that the flicker type, the modern places that people choose to photograph the most are very much the places that the early picturesque writers said were the most, the places to visit it and had the best views. And that seems to have carried on very much all the way through. Uh, and uh, with people largely focusing on the, the obvious places to go that are easily accessible. Uh, whether it's 17th century or 21st century, those same places seem very much, there's a continuity there that perhaps almost surprised me and in some ways goes a little bit against perhaps what the literary history might make you expect. Thank you. Uh, okay. A question on, um, you know, toggling between, you know, this, this, um, what Franco Moretti has called, you know, sort of distant reading and then toggling back. Has, have you done any close reading to get a sense of, you know, when you read, when you read or reread the text, do you pick up on this or is it, does it appear only at scale? I, yeah, I mean, the way we've tended to approach this is to use distant reading as a way of um a way of then directing close reading if you like so yeah. with one and a half million words it's probably too much to probably too much to close read all of it and still have a good memory about what all of it's saying so for instance if you're picking up a cluster of um uh da, 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 why what, uh, a cluster of travelers uh, being associated with a particular place or particular type of feature, where in the text is creating that cluster. And therefore, these are the bits of the text that you need to close read to try to understand what it is about those places that are being associated with, with travellers, why that's happening, um, uh, and, and to explain it. So I think what the distant reading approaches are good at doing is identifying broad patterns within it within text generally, and this goes across all of the distant reading type of ideas, it's good at identifying these broad patterns. It's very bad at explaining the patterns. To explain them, I think <laughs> you need to get back into close reading. But the two, if the two are set up as kind of antagonistic, that's wrong. The two should actually complement each other uh, and help each other. Well, where distant reading becomes very useful is where you've got too much to, to close read. The big limitation of close reading is it's slow. Uh, distant reading will actually summarise very large volumes of text very quickly, but you can only understand those summaries if you close read the parts of it that are driving the patterns that you're getting. And, and then again, sort of recapping the previous question, uh, have you given, again, any consideration to taking that self-description where people are describing themselves as tourists, not being described in the text as tourists, and seeing if those results hold? I know that that's probably think, a... Yeah, I think that's more, the way we do that is probably more by genre. So you pick pick out yeah. tourist guides and contrast yeah. them with some of the travelogues and contrast them with uh, perhaps some of the more uh, literary works, that kind of thing. Uh, so you come up with a, a genre that way and do comparisons uh, based on, 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 effectively on the metadata from there. Yeah. 
Well, I, I will say, uh, not directly bearing on your, well, a personal question informed by your research now, I do want to go back having spent a little bit of last summer in the Isle of Skye and having noticed just mm -hmm. what you described that the, the, the tourist density seems to vary. Old man, old man of store was just, I mean, if you want to hear um, Italian pop songs, go to the old man of store. Um, and then, you know, simply just a couple of kilometers up the road, it's like, oh, this is the Isle of Skye you're supposed to experience. That humble, and it makes me curious how long that density has been there. Not to, uh, but uh, as your research suggests, this is sort of ongoing. And in, in fact, rather than ease of travel making it more able to go to less ex accessibility, has not changed this. If anything, Instagram has increased the density. And I'm really, um, I I wonder if that holds across tourist destinations. The increased clustering of of uh, tourist toponyms. I suspect it does, or at least I suspect that um, over time you probably get you get more people visiting these places, and they'll be more talked about. But the proportion that get you know, more than a mile from the road or whatever, uh, more of a mile from the car park, or uh, nowadays the car yes. park, those would be the obvious um, either places where coaches would stop or places that are easy to walk to. Uh, probably hasn't changed very much. That would be, uh, yeah, I'd bet on that. I'd bet on that as well, yes. Mm -hmm. Any fun? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, hi, I'm kind of off to the side, so I don't know if you can see, but thank you for, for your really great talk. I'm curious, you keep on saying, like, we did this, we did we did that. I'm curious to hear about what who consists of your team um, when you were starting on this GIS project. Who did you, who did you talk to about getting into mapping and and what does it take to really carry out a project like this? Yeah, I mean, I suppose what I've been talking about here has gone over multiple years and quite a lot of different collaborators. I actually started, uh, I started here in Lancaster in 2006 uh, and I've not been here very long when somebody came into my office and said, could you do a GIS of Lake District writing? And because I was new, I said yes, uh, because you do when you're new, right? Um, that was a woman called Sally Bushell, who uh, professor of English, it was now professor of English here. Uh, had, she had a post a post uh, post uh, graduate who was just finishing his PhD called David Cooper. A lot of the early work was done by him and finding place names in just a couple of those texts. Uh, and then we got some more money to do it. People like Chris Donaldson. And that's when the geoparsing started. Chris Donaldson came along, Patty Marietta Flores. She did a lot of the early GIS work on it. And then more recently, uh, Joanna Taylor's uh, done a lot of the literary. Uh, I can't really do the interpretive stuff. She's done a lot of the literary stuff on that. Um, and uh, then collaborations with people like Zephyr Frank in Stanford, uh, Eric Steiner in Oregon, uh, and some people in Leeds doing uh what's called qualitative spatial representation which i didn't really talk about today uh there's been a long a long journey and rather well funded which has been nice but it's involved a lot of different people on it and uh i think it's one of the nice things about digital humanities projects is to do them well i think you do need to collaborate with people because people haven't got the skills across no one individual's got the skills across all the range of different skill sets that you need uh, and working with different people from different backgrounds, particularly crossing that kind of computational and humanities divide is really interesting, leads to some really stimulating work. Okay. Oh, yes, Adrian, thank you. I think also going off the last point as well, I think the customizability, and this is not a question, by the way, this is more of a comment, where the customizability of this project can truly just be applied to just about any subject that you're interested in. Because I can see this being applied to, of course, as you mentioned previously, the study of Holocaust currently, with Anne Kelly Knowles, but also just projects that Dr. Rubina is interested in, projects that I would be interested in, projects that I've been part of that didn't fully go the way we um, we wanted to because it's very tricky to collaborate as an undergraduate. <laughs> I'm just going to say that now. But we had this project in mind um, to basically map the construction of the Texas State Capitol and who built the Texas State Capitol. And it was a lot more than we ambitious than we realized. But at the same time, it was 
very fascinating to see what we could parse through with the um, geolocation based data based on census records and just cross checking mm -hmm. the payrolls of who and the pay swatch of who was working at the Capitol each year to in construction. So, I mean, I can see this being applied to various projects, not just specifically something under the English like district. Insurance. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, strangely enough, um, when we first got into this, the late I thought the Lake District stuff was basically just a pilot before I got back to uh, 19th century social history, which is what really interests me. But uh, it's taken me off for, onto the Lake District stuff and more recently onto Holocaust stuff, which I never anticipated getting involved in. But uh, it's the for me, it's the methods that really drive my interest in it more than the the applied subject area. But again, that's where collaboration becomes important because um, because other people bring the topics. Uh, but as you say, yeah, if you can do it with anything where geography matters and where you have digital records, you can start to apply these sorts of techniques to. Uh, and your experience isn't untypical in that a large proportion of the time you end up spending is often spent in the data, if you like, the database creation phase, the finding the place mm -hmm. names, the mapping them, that sort of thing. And the actual really interesting stuff is a relatively small period at the end um, creating the databases tends to be what takes the time and is mm -hmm. often not the most interesting part of the project either. Yeah, that, that was basically where we can have more. <laughs> Just because there was a sheer amount of information and it was a project between two seniors at the time, um, one of which was working on a thesis, an undergraduate thesis, and the other one was uh, also trying to lead a student run or the <laughs> same time based on digital humanities at UT. So very tricky, but it is a project that we would probably like to do in the future, but you don't know if you'll ever do it. So, but it is a really interesting project. I think it can be, and again, it shows like the adaptability to spatial geography, to answering various questions about social history and history in general, and not just history. I mean, we have a literature student, you know, Wait, you're managing. Yeah. Anyway, we're just the All right, we're just at the 115 mark. Uh, Professor Gregory, thank you so much. This was fantastic. Thank you. We'll be back in touch. Thank you. Pleasure. I've enjoyed it. Thanks a lot.